All right. So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Wendy and I's, or Dr. Gibbs and I's, uh, session on spine anatomy, imaging, and intervention. We're going to keep this very clinically relevant. Um, we're going to give you some nice examples of uh, trauma, infection, and if we have enough time, we'll do a little bit of tumor at the end. Uh, we're going to talk about the clinical presentation of and radiographic presentation of these entities. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the things that you should kind of look out for when you're when you're a, um, a medical student or a neurosurgery intern or an ER resident or whatever, wherever your path in, in medicine brings you. Radiologist. And, uh, kind of, okay. Or radiologist. And teach you how to, um, how to kind of intelligently and sequentially go through these things and talk about them with your chief resident or the neurosurgery attending. So with that being said, let us go ahead and... Wait, I want to say continue. something too. I want to say something too. Thank you. This is going to be really, I, I hope this is okay with, with you, Rizuli. It's going to be informal because that's the way I think both of us like to teach. It's not going to be a lecture. We're going to go through a lot of cases. And, and like Rizuli said, we're going to try to give you everything relevant we can that's important for medical students, interns, residents, any level of training. Um, please join in, ask us questions. I don't know whether it goes in the chat or QA. We'll keep an eye on both. Um, and as, as Ryan was saying, thanks so much, Ryan, for inviting us. We, Jonathan and I, Rizuli and I work together on virtual spine, as he said, and do a lot of other stuff together, too. So it seemed appropriate to do this one together as well. And just, sorry, I'm going to say one more thing. Um, you'll know when you're a medical student, you're going to see more and more as you go up in your training that it's not you and your specialty. You're working with a team to take care of your patients. And that team is all the different specialties involved. And the more you get to know those people and those different teams and uh, more about what they do, not only will you learn more and you'll become a better, um, you know, trainee, medical student, resident, attending, but you'll also be able to take better care of your patients. And so it seemed very appropriate that we'd have radiology and neurosurgery together to teach this stuff. So now, without further ado, let's get started. How's that? Okay, so we're going to start with trauma. I don't think we're not going to get to tumor. We're just going to do trauma infection. We had a bigger scope for all this when we started, but like uh, Ryan was saying, there's so much coming up this fall, so many more opportunities for us to give you more. So this is going to be a little bit more in depth and some of it might seem like too much, but what we always tell what, in radiology, what we always tell our residents is it seems like you're drinking out of a fire hose. You have to know every body part. You have to know every modality. You have to know every pathology, but you go through it again and again, and eventually it'll stick. So right now, this might seem like a lot, but it's gonna be in the back of your mind. You've seen it now. So next time you see it, you'll recognize it. You might not know everything by heart, but it'll be easier each time you see it. All right. Yeah. So just looking at these uh, pictures, we're gonna go through kind of each one of these examples. Um, and basically uh, what you see on the left-hand side here, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through this very sequentially and, and kind of see kind of the things that you need to um, find. But if you look here, what you see is uh, this patient has pretty significant osteophytes in the front and in the back of the spine, okay? And there's, that's a condition that we will talk a little bit more about. Here, what you can see is that this patient, you see these are, these are verte <coughs> vertebral bodies and intervertebral discs. And you see this is kind of a normal looking disc, normal looking disc, normal looking disc, and then something weird is going on here. And you can see something weird is going on here in the spinal cord. You can see how it's normal above possibly a little bit normal below, and then something is happening here. We'll talk about that. Here you can see that obviously the bones are not aligned. There's some sort of a fracture, some sort of a fracture here, and then this one is pretty obvious. So, all right, <clears throat> we'll start from the beginning, and I'll let uh, Wendy go ahead. You can uh, kind of give us the background of this patient. All right, this was a patient, this was a seven-year-old woman who was, you know, pretty healthy, except she did have osteoporosis, and she was at her kid's house and she had not a ground level fall, but she fell down a couple stairs and she had really severe back pain, very stoic, but her pain just lasted all day. So her kids put her in the car and took her to the ER. Now, the first two images that you see um, are x-rays. So I'm sure everybody here has seen an x-ray. So, you know, a, a lateral view and a, a frontal view. Um, are you gonna point, do you have your pointer, Rizuli? Yeah. No point to those, okay, thanks. So, you know, whenever we get x-rays, when I see an x-ray come up on my list as a radiologist, my first thought for a trauma, for ER, my first thought is that a ER doctor doesn't think anything's wrong with this person. If they really thought there was something bad, they would have gotten a CT. So I think that's how I know this lady was really stoic. She wasn't complaining. But they got the x-rays, and 
on the lateral view, you can see that, you know, going down the spinal column, you've got normal vertebral bodies, normal, 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 and then you see one that's flat. So that's her compression fracture, osteoporotic compression fracture. So, you know, we read that, we called the ER doc, they immediately, you know, took him to CT while they were making the other phone calls to work up this patient, which Rizuli's going to talk about in a second. But, you know, the CAT scanner's right there, it just takes a few seconds. So I'm going to tell you about the CAT scan, and um, you'll hear a little bit more about how they cared for this patient. So on a CAT scan, third picture over, you can again see normal vertebral bodies and then a flat one, and that's the compressed one. And importantly, you can see that the back of the vertebral body, the posterior superior aspect is going back into the canal. Now you all have had basic anatomy, so you know that there's no spinal cord down there, but there are nerve roots and that is compressing the fecal sac, so it's important. Very bottom picture is an axial view, so you're looking from their feet toward their head. If they're laying on a table, you're seeing a perpendicular slice of their body and you see a bone fragment going into the canal, which should normally be oval shaped around. And you can see that's causing some uh, mass effect on the fecal sac and the nerve roots. Now, actually, if you want to go to the next one, you can either talk about management here or we can talk about the MRI. What would you like to do? Okay. Let's talk about, uh, so in terms of the initial workup, if a patient like this came into the emergency room, um, the it, it's kind of rare that they start off with x-rays and get a CAT scan and get an MRI. Usually the, the first imaging test that a patient will get if this patient was in acute trauma is a, is a CT. That's usually what you're, you're dealing with. Um, the per, there's really no reason to get a, uh, in terms of the clinical utility, um, if, you have a, if you have a CT, you don't really need to get an x-ray, okay? But the vice versa is not true. If you have an x-ray that shows something abnormal, you generally want to follow that up with a CT, okay? The only real utility of the x-ray is if this patient was standing and bearing weight when this uh, x-ray was obtained. If they're laying supine on a, uh, on a table when this x-ray was obtained, it really does not provide any, any more information than the CT. Because many times, um, although things look abnormal or they look kind of bad on CT, uh, you will be surprised how either good and or bad or possibly worse they look on, um, on a uh, weight-bearing x-ray. So it's very important in particular with trauma. At some point during that patient's hospitalization that they need some sort of an upright or a standing x-ray um, of the area of pathology, okay? And that being said, before we get into the management and, and more of the workup and more where we can discuss the morphology of this type of, uh, of this fracture. Because when you're, again, when you're discussing this with your resident or your chief resident or your attending, you want to be able to talk about this intelligently. You don't want to be like, oh, there's a compression fracture at L4. That doesn't, you know, doesn't really, it means nothing to us. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. So let's go, let's talk about the MRI first. Nothing to you. Okay, so for the MRI, this is something, you know, this is pretty complex if you're a medical student, although I know that our friend Nader Dadale has talked to you before. He's given you some great spine lectures. I actually was there, I saw them. So I know he's talked about the different sequences that we look at. And so we won't go into too much detail on this, but just basically, you probably remember from what he said, the main sequences we have are T1 sagittal, which is the first picture. Then we have a T2. And then the third one is stir. And the, um, the only importance that I won't get into the physics of it, but that really highlights water. It either highlights edema within a bone in a fracture or infection or cancer. So the first one and the third one are probably the most useful in this case. So in the first picture, you see that the vertebral bodies all are bright. They're kind of the color of the fat in the back, the subcutaneous fat. And that's because bone marrow has fat. So if there's something else in the bone marrow, whether it's edema or cancer or infection, it turns black. So we can see that our fracture is black. That's how we know it's acute and not chronic. If she had had that for years and never gotten it treated somehow, it wouldn't be that color. So in this case, we know it's acute. The second picture over, we can see that it's going back, it's compressing those nerve roots. That's what we saw on CT, but here we can actually see the nerve roots, unlike CT or X-ray, so we can see what it's doing. And the third picture, again, it shows that there's edema in that vertebral body. It also shows us, importantly, that there are no other vertebral bodies involved. If this was higher up in the spine, it would also show us that there's any signal abnormality in the spinal cord itself if there was a cord injury. And then the axial view on the bottom, that's also an axial T2. And it shows you again what that's doing to the fecal sac. Just on this, like on the CT, it should be an oval with the nerve roots kind of floating freely in there. But we can see that it's compressed by that bone fragment that's gone backwards into the canal. The, uh, 
the one thing I want to add is th this positive stress signal here shows the acuity. I think you may have mentioned this, but it shows the acuity of the fracture. So sometimes, um, going back to the previous slide, how do you know this is new, right? Sometimes, you know, you see like chronic compression. This is obviously acute, but um, sometimes you see chronic compression fractures that can be um, really, really, really nasty looking. They can be like a vertebra plana. They can just look really bad. And you, you're not really exactly sure whether or not that's um, new versus old. So a STIR MRI, sagittal STIR, will let you know of the acuity of that fracture. So you can um, rule that out. So if you get this, you know immediately uh, this is a relatively newer um, a relatively newer fracture. Now, that being said, uh, frequently when you are communicating the results of imaging scans to your, to your let's say your, we'll just use your, your uh, chief resident in this case, um, you, you know, you may be asked to send a video or you may be asked to take a picture of the MRI and, uh, and transmit it to them so they can see. The, you always want to err towards doing a midline sagittal T2 or a midline sagittal uh, CT. These are the these are the two scans that tell us the most information. So you and then if, if there's stir positivity, you want to give that as well too. These are the most important ones that we want to see right away. All right. So all right, just, yeah, let me see just what happened to this person, and you can talk about the ligaments. So okay. this is a different woman. This was a, a little bit older woman who had severe back pain, um, and she was going to the place where she got injections for back pain, and that's where she actually fell. Now, if you look at the so the top one is a sagittal stir that we were just talking about. Bottom one is a CT. And just, I want to say about the CT, you can see that there's no bone in the back. So she had had previous surgery decompression for spinal stenosis in, in the past. So um, that's why that looks like that. Now back to the top one, we were just talking about injuries you can have to the bones. The last case we just showed was a fracture causing compression of the thecal sac. Now this is different. There is no fracture here or, you know, no significant compression fracture. The injury she has, which is equally, I would think, as dangerous, is a disruption of the ligaments. And so on that top view, you can see, so the disc should not be bright, like fluid, like edema. They should be a little darker. That one's bright because that disc is injured. Right in front of that disc, there should be a black ligament that's holding the spine together, the anterior longitudinal ligament, and that's gone. Posteriorly, too, there's disruption of the, probably, or at least stretching of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Also a very important uh, cause of injury, even without fracture. So I'll let, I'll let Razuli now talk about that anatomy and how that's significant. Yeah, so your spine is comprised of bones, vertebral bodies, intervertebral discs, right? Pedicles, which you, can't, you can see right here on this image, the pedicles, right? The vertebral bodies are connected to the posterior elements by the pedicles, right? Um, Lamina, spinous process, and facet joints, which you can't really see on this image, okay? You can see the facet joints here, and you can see the spinous processes here. You don't really see lamina in this view, but all this, these are all the, the essentially the bony anatomy of the, the, the spine. Now, the thing that holds all this together are the muscle and the ligaments, and these are extremely important and confer significant stability. Um, and in many ways, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> here we Oh, you're busy. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so they convert significant stability to um, to uh, the spine, and in fact, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, there's been uh, studies, uh, in particular, one that came out of Thomas Jefferson University, which uh, came up with a uh, injury severity scale for thoracolumbar injuries that really takes into account how important the posterior ligamentous complex is in contributing for stability for the lumbar and thoracic spine, and also in the cervical spine as well too. So don't take these ligaments for granted. That's the most important thing. So moving from, so <clears throat> moving from, uh, it depends on your frame of reference. If you're operating on the spine, right, this is gonna be the most superficial ligament you see. And then you, as you go down, it's gonna be the most uh, deep ligament. So here is the supraspinous ligament. It sits on top, supraspinous means it's on top of the spinous processes. This one does not really confer too much stability to the spine. Uh, but if, if at all possible, we like to preserve it during, um, during our cases. The interspinous ligament, the ligamentum flavum, or the yellow ligament. It's interesting that they decided to make this one blue rather than color coded yellow, but that's okay. Um, then you have the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament and the anterior longitudinal ligament. And these, are, um, these have more significance when 
uh, when you're doing a uh, discectomy or if you are trying to do a deformity correction and, uh, of, of, the, of the thoracolumbar spine. And these ligaments can often uh, uh, inhibit and uh, impede your ability to obtain a good, uh, good lordosis or restore lordosis in patients who are significantly kyphotic. So you have to take these ligaments down. And there's certain techniques on how to do that successfully without injuring the great vessels, which lie right in front of the vertebral bodies here. So basically, uh, my long-winded uh, explanation is that these ligaments are very important and do not take them for granted. So an injury like this, although it looks like, oh, you may look at it, oh, it's a big deal. It's just like a disc. It's not, you know, it's not unstable really. It's just like, you know, you know, it'll, it'll heal on its own. No, these, these kind of injuries can be very, very unstable in particular with a patient who has no, uh, has or compromised or has uh, uh, posterior elements are essentially no longer present. Um, this, is, this is a very, very highly unstable injury. So it would, that would likely need um, a surgical intervention. Now, I said before um, about this uh, thoracolumbar injury classification severity score, or TLIX as we say it, uh, what this score does, or this grading scale does, is it looks at, um, it, it offers a, essentially a guide for surgeons when you're looking at something, when you're looking at a, a patient's radiographic imaging, you're looking at their neurologic exam, it gives you an idea of what is the urgency of surgery or, or timing of surgery, okay? Does this patient need surgery or not? So there are three things that you look at, okay? Um, two of them can be obtained from the imaging itself, and one of them has to be obtained from the actual neurologic exam. So uh, what you look at here and um, what you see in this slide is basically you look at one, the integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex or the PLC, and that comprise, is comprised of ligamentum flavum, facet capsule, um, intraspinous ligament, and supraspinous ligament. And what that means is that if these are disrupted or suspected to be disrupted, that confers a higher degree of instability to the spine than if you know that they're intact. So things that are like fracture dislocations or distraction type injuries uh, often have involvement of the PLC. And as a result, those are technically unstable injuries. Um, other things that I look at are the morphology of uh, potentially compression fractures like burst or partial burst fractures. And last but not least, we look at uh, the patient's neurologic exam, whether they are neurologically intact, have an incomplete spinal cord injury, complete spinal cord injury, or things like caught equina. These are all taken into account into the severity scale. And basically what it does is it says, you know, it's on a scale of, I forget the actual numbers itself, but um, higher numbers, uh, more points mean that this patient needs will likely need surgical intervention and lower points mean that this patient um, will, can, you can potentially uh, wait and see or try conservative management. Um, another variant of the uh, TLEX, there are many different, let me put it this way, there are many different grading scales for uh, thoracolumbar injuries. And one of them is the AO spine criteria. And there are, we have more slides on this and we'll look at it as well too. So there's TLEX, which is more clinically oriented, and if AO spine, which is more morphology oriented, um, although there are more papers coming out to uh, suggest that certain morphology, trying to confer a clinical significance to the morphologies of the injuries, but this is what we use to kind of, um, to describe the injuries a little bit better. So you can have, broadly speaking, three different types of uh, uh, thoracolumbar type fractures on the AO spine criteria. You have type A, which are compression injuries, or only the anterior column, um, very and do, generally do not involve uh, a significant portion of the middle of column and do not involve the posterior column at all. And they have type B, which are distraction injuries, which by definition um, have to involve the posterior column or disruption of the posterior tension band. And type C, which are the uh, fracture dislocation type injuries, which are all, these, these are the worst of the worst. These, these type of injuries are always unstable and always need um, surgical intervention. So <clears throat> what this does is, as you can imagine, there are no, no, no two traumas are similar. Everyone's trauma is unique in some way. But what we try to do is we try to reduce some of the heterogeneity of um, the, the radiographic imaging of traumas. And we try to introduce homogeneity in the way we describe them, the way we do research on them, and the way that we, um, and the way that we treat them. So, <clears throat> so you know, it's, it's good to, and it's a good exercise. And I always would try to do this when I was describing um, let's say burst fractures or vertebral body uh, uh, compression type fractures uh, to my attendings, I would tell them it's an AO spine uh, type A3, for example. 
or uh, an AOSpine type, you know, B2 or something like that. And they would generally appreciate that because they knew exactly what I was talking about. And it shows that I, I took the time and the effort to look at the images and um, get an idea of what, uh, you know, what we were dealing with. So um, going back here, um, so we have uh, type A uh, Can fractures. Can I yeah, say sure. something real quick? Can you go back for a second? Yeah. Because our friend Carlton Watson asked a great question. And I just want to address it real quick because I tried to type it, but I can't listen and type at the same time. So I want to say it real quick. So he asked if, if you only do this at the initial injury or if you do it later to see if it's changed. And just a fundamental concept about this and the way we go through them and the way that the AO spine mm -hmm. tells you to go through this um, classification. When you're looking at the spine when they come in the ER after initial injury, you see the worst one first, is it a translation? Is it already frankly unstable? Is there motion of one body on another such that there is cord injury can all compromise? Mm -hmm. If not, then you move down to B. Is there a distraction? Is there both, is there posterior tension band or anterior tension band injury? A lot of times C by definition, actually a lot of times, all the time, C by definition will have component of B. C has to have B. It has to have either anterior or posterior tension band injury in order to move like that. C will also likely have a component of A. It'll probably have some kind of a compression. Now, if you rule out C and you go to B, if you have anterior posterior tension band injury, you obviously don't have a C and it's not gonna move to a C, likely, unless you throw them off the table or something. They fall off the table, I don't know, whatever. But it might have an A. And if you're starting with an A, if it's only anterior column, if it's only involving the vertebral body itself, no tension bands, then it's not going to move to a B or a C, again, unless they fall off the table or something bad happens to them. So really, only you only need to do this at the initial scan. You don't need to do this again. It's a classification to see where they go immediately, where you're triaging this person in terms of management. You agree with that, Rizzoli? Is that a good answer? Yeah. So you want to, uh, you want to, um, so, so for the telix and AO spine, you want to do it at the time of uh, when they arrive. The, the difference is, I think what you're referring to, Carlton, is the Asia scale. And uh, although we do do the Asia scale at the time of the injury, it's not technically correct. It, we generally should, the, the most accurate Asia uh, scale in terms of grading the severity of spinal cord injury is somewhere between 48 and 72 hours after the injury. So that's how we get a better idea of what the patient's true Asia scale is. Now, this is more uh, a, 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 this, a clinical decision rules on whether or not you should, you can potentially conservatively manage this patient who comes in with like say a type A2 type fracture uh, versus somebody who needs to go to the OR right away. So that's how, that's, you, you want to do AO spine and telix at the time of um, the scan. So this is why it's good that we're doing this together because I just learned something there too. Because when we're doing this, when this person comes in the ER, I'm reading that CT and I'm giving you one of those injuries. You're looking at it too, but Supposedly, I'm the one that's the expert on the CT, but I don't know anything about the age. I don't know anything about the patient. So there's right. more to it. So that's why it's good that we're, we're working these patients up all together as a team. Yeah, exactly. Totally agree. So um, going on to the different types of AO, this is now we're talking about AO spine criteria. Again, AO spine talks more about the morphology of the injury. That, that's the, the main uh, goal of the AO spine criteria um, with a secondary goal of guiding clinical decision making. Okay, it's not as well defined as Telex. Telex's goal is to decide whether or not his patient needs surgery, or you can, or something indeterminate, or whether you can maybe conservatively manage it. Okay, so Telex for clinical, AO spine for morphology. So you can see here, it goes from a there's an A zero, which is basically insignificant type fractures, and then it goes from A one to A four, and it's generally confers the severity of the type of injury. However, these A2 type fractures, which is interesting, is these A2 type fractures are, <coughs> are um, highly unlikely to heal well, unlike oblique type fractures. These often need some sort of surgical intervention versus A3, which um, potentially based on uh, the patient's neurologic exam, their age, their, their degree of um, the, you know, the bone quality, their health, you could potentially conservatively manage these. And then these A4s uh, tend to also need to be um, surgically managed. So it sees a little, there's a little bit of, it's not it's as straightforward as you would think. Um, oftentimes, uh, the best way to know whether or not a patient will need surgical intervention is getting, if they can tolerate it, a weight-bearing x-ray. And that's where the utility comes in. Because you can see, um, you know, you're not, when you're, someone's getting a CT or an, or an MRI, they're laying supine on a table and they're not in, they're, 
true physiologic alignment when they're standing up. I mean, things can drastically change when someone's standing up. So the utility of x-ray is not for a patient to lay supine. The utility of the x-ray in this setting is to have them stand up and take a look. And I will say this again, if you have a patient admitted to your service with trauma and some sort of fracture to the spine, they cannot leave your service unless they have an upright or a weight-bearing x-ray, okay? It's the most important scan they're gonna get, more important than the CT or MRI. Is, uh, is, is the uh, a weight-bearing scan. So make sure every trauma patient has an upright or standing, AP and lateral, lumbar, or if they have a cervical injury, cervical x-ray before they get discharged, okay? Super important. And if they have a collar, make sure they're in a collar when they get that x-ray because then you know how that patient's likely gonna heal if you decided to treat this patient conservatively. And in the case of a lumbar fracture, you want them to be in, a, let's say, an LSO or a TLSO. All right. So, um, okay, I, I don't really Can I get into that. Go back for a second. Sure. Because I know there are people, and they're not just neurosurgery people here, there are radiology people here too. So just real quick about the way I tell people to look at this when we're looking at the fracture. So if we know it's anterior column only, these A-types, what I tell people to do, again, you're going from worst to least bad. You want to rule out the very worst thing first. So we would start with A4. So see if they have an A4. You look at the posterior cortex. Is the posterior cortex involved? If it is, you know it's three or four, so that's a burst, a complete burst or an incomplete burst. The next thing you look at is the end plates. So if it's just one end plate, that's incomplete, so that's A3, point A3, thank you. If it's both end plates, it's A4, which is a complete burst. Now that split fracture, that, I'm glad you said that, Rosalie, because I didn't know, I thought those were more severe, but I didn't know the significance of the healing, so that's interesting. Um, but despite that, the posterior cortex is intact. There's no chance of retropulsion of fragments into the canal. And then A, like you said, it's just a one end plate. We see those all the time. Um, probably not very significant and the least bad. But always go from the worst to the least. So look at that posterior cortex first. All right, now go on. Okay, so these are the type B on the AO spine um, classification scale. And as you can see, these, <clears throat> these involve, and generally they involve the posterior ligamentous complex, except for the type B3, which are... Um, <clears throat> They involve the anterior middle and they're uh, uh, generally hyperextension type injuries. They're a little bit different. Um, so if you look here, this, this is a posterior osseous, osseous tension band or it can be pure ligamentous tension band, distraction type injury, or is it a chance type fracture where you have um, uh, a hyperflexion type injury over a fixed point anterior to the um, instantaneous axial rotation of the spine. So uh, what that could be is like, um, you are like on a, uh, let's say like a roller coaster and you have a bar holding you down and then it suddenly stops and you flex forward like this. Like this is, this is that type of, this is this type of injury, okay? Where you fall and you like, you fall on like a, like a, a fence or something. We, we once saw a patient that happened to. Um, I won't tell you why that happened, but let's just say that uh, <laughs> he needed surgery. And then um, these are obviously more unstable. This involves essentially all three columns, as you can see. And this, these need surgery. With the hyperextension type injuries, what's unique about these is that these often, we see these um, in patients who have uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which we'll talk a little bit more about, for patients who have um, DISH or diffuse idiopathic uh, skeletal hyperostosis. And what happens here is, as we saw in that patient who had the laminectomy defect and the hyperextension injury with the disruption of disc space, um, these patients, these are, these are very scary injuries. They often are highly unstable. You generally need an MRI. And, um, and although they can sometimes look very, in this case, you can see they're very exaggerated. It's very obvious, but sometimes these can look very, very, uh, very, very subtle and they, they can be hard to find. Um, and although they're detectable on MRI, you may not easily see them on CT. And, uh, and once every couple of years, there's a patient who has like a very, uh, a, a, say like a hyperextension type injury in a rigid spine that uh, is just so subtle that it's often missed and read as being intact. And then the patient has like some sort of horrible like uh, uh, iatrogenic uh, like hot, uh, spinal cord injury while they're in the hospital because no one knows that they're like grossly unstable and they try to get them out of bed and then boom. So um, one thing that we don't see here about point your I uh, 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 give you as a little bit of a pearl is in patients who have a hyperextension injury of the ALL or the disc space. Sometimes what you can see 
are little um, gas bubbles or uh, little black dots at the ALL or inside the actual disc space itself. Um, and that can give you an idea, sometimes even in the spinal canal. And that can give you a little idea. Kind of, if you see something like that in a patient who has a rigid spine, meaning AS or DISH, you want to have a little bit higher index of suspicion that something bad happened. And you just want to, I would play it safe and get an MRI because the MRI will show you everything. Can I say something about that too? So sure. yeah, we have to be careful. You just said it. Sometimes these are so subtle because patients with ankylosing spondylitis, especially, are very osteoporotic and you cannot see, yes. you can't see anything and let alone a very subtle fracture. And it's vital that these are recognized by radiologists, all the radiology one of the people who are going to be radiologists out there because these people, like I, when I worked at a county hospital, a lot of these people came in, we didn't know their history. They didn't even know their history. They didn't even know they had it. And if that is missed and they go to surgery or they're being moved, they can break very easily. They're very fragile. And even if they don't have a fracture, you can cause one or you can cause an additional one. Very common. So yeah. super subtle injury that is hard mm -hmm. to see. And again, that's probably a little advanced for today, but a very important one. Go on. Oh, can, okay, we'll ask that question later. We're going to ask you a question about the um, standing x-rays at the break. Don't let us forget. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. And then uh, type C, as you can see, without getting too deeply into this, these are just obviously like the worst of the worst, just super unstable. These always need surgery. Um, I mean, this is like just complete disruption and uh, dislocation of the spine. Do you want to add anything to this? I don't, I don't uh, yeah, this so just, again, like I said at the beginning, when we're working these up, you want to start from the very worst type of injury, rule it out before you go to the next. So this one, obviously, frankly, unstable. you got one bone moving on top of another. That means that everything is disrupted. Your anterior column, your posterior column, your ligaments are disrupted. So that one goes to surgery immediately because there's always going to be canal compromise and likely cord injury. That's probably enough for that. Yeah. Um, the, the reason you may wonder why operate on someone who's complete injury with, with, a, um, with a scan like this, right? Uh, so th there are good, there's good data to support the fact or the support um, the role of early surgical intervention in these patients uh, as a, a pretty significant portion of these patients do improve later on with surgical intervention versus those that are just treated conservatively. You majorly improve the patient's quality, even if they're paraplegic, it, as is probably the case with this patient here, you majorly improve their quality of life by, by reducing and, um, and, and f fixing the fracture as they're now able to sit upright. They can be transferred easily. Uh, you know, they don't have any of the issues of this like basically grossly unstable uh, spine. And then last but not least, you also reduce the incidence of delayed deterioration in these patients because although this patient's paraplegic, they still have function of their arms theoretically. And what happens is, is if you have like this fracture that doesn't heal well and it's arthrosis and it's just kind of um you know not healing the way it should these patients can often develop delayed spinal cord tethering they can develop a syrinx or a syringomyelia and then this can make them lose function in their arms later down the line so that is something also to keep in mind in these patients is the reason to operate on them okay so um you know you don't want to just say oh there's no point in operating on this patient is is a complete spinal cord injury that this is totally you know is a hopeless scenario. It's not a hopeless scenario. There, there are a lot of things you can do to help this patient surgically. Um, I think this is a little complicated. I don't think there's really much well, to get into here. This basically shows what I'm seeing, the way yeah. you go. You start at the worst, yeah. rule things out as you go down. Is there translation? Yeah. No. You go there, is there anterior or posterior tension manager? No. You go down to the next one. Is it all yeah. the anterior column? Then it's A. And that's important. Very different. Usually less severe, although can be, but different type of injury, A, then C, then B, all very right. different. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So going back to the first patient that we saw, so what we can see here is that there is disruption of <clears throat> the superior end plate, right? It does not get to the inferior end plate. It involves the, at least the 100% of the width of the vertebral body, not just the anterior, let's say third or, or half. So you can say that this is a type A3, an L4 incomplete burst fracture, right? Perfect. So you can see here, this is, this is uh, in the scan, you see the acuity of the fracture, you see edema, uh, bone marrow edema. You see, this is just showing the actual uh, illustration itself. It, I mean, it virtually looks exactly the same. Um, and you see a little bit of retropulsion of the- Let me say something about the MRI, don't go on. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Point to the, point to the superior inflate of L4 for me. 
This is such a nice, this is actually a different case that shows you how common it is because we have multiple pictures of this, multiple cases. This is a very common one. That, so black line is the end plate. We see that black line is disrupted and we know that even though the disc looks the same color as the others, we know that disc is injured because the superior end plate is, that line is discontinuous. Right now. We also know that means there's a fracture of the superior end plate. Ventrally, yeah. you can see there's disruption of the anterior longitudinal ligament on the MRI. But look right, yeah, down there, exactly. So it should be a black line, a continuous black line. You see there's no black down there. So that is anterior longitudinal ligament disruption. Same with posterior, black line. All ligaments should be black on, on MRI, on all sequences, because they're fibrous. There's no, no water in them. And so the, the PLL, posterior longitudinal ligament, discontinuous, right behind the vertebral body. Thank you. Good. Thanks. So PLL, ALL, probably ligamentum flavum, although we can't see that well on sagittal all the time. That's just what mm -hmm. I wanted to add on that MRI. Yeah. And you can see here, just look, these are the um, axial scans through the level of the injury. You can see that, look at that. It's almost, um, almost, I would say 80% of the canal width is compromised here. And it's the same thing here on, on the MRI. You can see that the, the fecal sac is totally smushed. All right. So, <clears throat> Now let's talk a little about what are the surgical things to do for this patient, okay? So in this case, um, we'll, we can talk a little bit about this, but uh, one of the things you wanna know is, so these, this, is a, this is a type of burst fracture, okay? There's a lot of literature, you would wanna know the, uh, the neurologic status of this patient before you do any sort of surgery. Um, if this patient is neurologically intact, they fall into a different category of patient. Um, and there's a lot of, again, very controversial literature, but there's a lot of literature showing um, that in, for in patients with burst fractures of a lumbar spine or thoracic spine who are neurologically intact and are not grossly unstable, there is some room for conservative management in these patients. Because even though you see this big fragment here in the canal, these things often resorb over time. Okay, And it, you're like, you look at it, you're like, oh my God, I, how can I leave it like that? Believe it or not, if you re-image them uh, about a year or two years down the road, these, this will be gone. And this, this fragment completely resorbs the the what the the pathophysiology of this type of fracture is that this acutely, this, the, the and yes, actually, this is a nice image because what happens is the inner vertebral disc acutely herniates inside the vertebral body and the vertebral body basically expands out like that, okay? And as things kind of settle down and cool down, it all kind of follows, falls back into place. So although it looks really bad here, if this patient is neurologically intact and they can tolerate a standing up, uh, upright x-ray, uh, then and it, everything looks good and they're in good alignment, you can potentially just conservatively manage this patient, okay? Now, in this Wait, case, what you see- X-ray, let me interject and ask your question yeah. while you're saying that. So the question was asked, what is the minimum timing to do your weight-bearing X-rays? When the patient, as, as soon as possible, as soon so, as the patient can tolerate. So it's often that there's so much- Or discharge, or both. So, okay. So if you can, I mean, ideally, if you can get it, at the, if the patient can tolerate it, again, because usually this is, very, this is very painful, right? They're not going to be able to. Uh, they're not going to be able to stand right away. I mean, most likely. I mean, you can really try, but you're not going to get a good effort out of the patient. So as soon as they're able and they're pain controlled and they're able to stand and tolerate it, you want to get it. And once you get one and everything looks good on that image, image, you're good. You don't need to get another one. Okay. Um, ideally, you get it soon after the injury, but really, realistically speaking, it will be as soon as the patient can tolerate it. Okay. Again, this is for these are for cases where it's a kind of indeterminate stability, okay? If you see like a AO spine type three fracture, patient's not gonna be able to stand. You, you need to take that patient for surgery, okay? Um, now, what's interesting here is the, the intervention that was done, okay? So what you see was, uh, is this the same patient? Or is this something different or? It's a different patient. This, yeah, 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 I'm looking at this. This can't possibly be L4, okay. So what we see here, uh, I'm thinking was L1 about? Is this L1 fracture or? T12, okay. So this is a T12 fracture. So it's at the thoracolumbar junction, right? T12, uh, T11, T12, L1. So these type of fractures are, um, are, are tricky because they're at a junctional point, okay? And what happens here, what was, what was done by the surgeon here is that they placed, uh, uh, I don't know if it's percutaneous or open, but they placed pedicle screws up one level above, one level below, and a cross link um, uh, above the injury. Now, here's the problem with short segment fusions, okay? In particular at the thoracolumbar junction. There is very good evidence to show that doing this short segment fusion, 
um, with, with, and not involving the, uh, the vertebral body itself, meaning what you, if you want to do a short segment fusion, you should try to get a pedicle screw inside the, the index level, meaning there should be a screw in this level. Then you can do a short segment fusion. There's, it's far more stable than if you do a short segment fusion, one up, one down. If you the, the, really, the, the thing, this is a very high risk of failure. And as you can see in the next image, this was, I'm not sure when this was done, how, how far after, but you see that there was a fracture at the screws. Um, they've sued arthros and this patient is developing progressive kyphotic deformity, okay? This could have been avoided with going maybe two up, two down, three up, three down, whatever, the, you know, the patient's anatomy and, and uh, fractured, you know, kind of their physiology dictates. So that, that if you don't want to, if you're not able to or don't want to put a screw at the index level, you, you are committed to going higher up, up and down from the, uh, from the injury itself. So this, this could have been, this is, this is predictable. Uh, this, this outcome was very predictable. So that you see that this, these uh, screws broke, okay? Um, the patient's developing progressive um, uh, segmental kyphosis and the fracture looks like it's getting worse. So they probably had to take this patient back and then they had to do anterior column reconstruction, which if you do that, if you do a corpectomy, then you can do a one up, one down without uh, instrumenting the index level. But this is obviously a much bigger surgery. So uh, you know, much bigger blood loss, much more technically challenging, much higher stakes as compared to um, posterior decompression, two up, two up, two down, three up, three down, whatever you need to do to get to stabilize them in the acute period. But, um, but uh, yes, so that, that, that's basically what happened here. Uh, what is there to say about this? This is just basically a, a chance type fracture. Is that uh, what we're trying to show here, Wendy? Yeah, so, um, yeah. yes. I wonder if I can, now that we're going a little bit, we're gonna give people a little bit of break. I'm gonna see if I can actually request the remote control, see if this works. And see if I can point to stuff and then give it back to you. Can we see Oh, that? here we go. Yeah, yeah, here, I got it, approved. How's that? Okay, can you see my mouse now? Can you see my mouse or no? I, I, don't, I don't see your mouse, but let me see something. Okay. I don't see your mouse, do you see it? No, too bad. Um, I don't see it, unfortunately. Okay, that's all right. Okay, so you can go back. You can uh, take it back then. I'll just describe it. Okay. So, whatever you need to do. It says I'm still controlling your screen, but that's okay. Okay. I'm going to stop remote control. There we go. Okay. So okay. sagittal CT, the first thing we're going to do, like I said, when we go down, first we want to rule out the very worst. That's what this algorithm is on the right, so you can see it. We want to rule out the worst type of injury, the translation. So you look at the vertebral bodies. Is there movement on one on, on another? No. So there's no translation. So it's not a C type. So we go down. What's the next injury type? Is there a tension band injury, anterior or posterior? If you look in the back, so first of all, we know there's something wrong here. There's a focal angle here, a focal kyphosis that shouldn't be there. But if you look in the posterior elements in the spinous process, there's a fracture there. We know that there's a posterior <laughs> ligamentous complex, a posterior column injury. So that's going to be a type B. It's a posterior tension band injury. So now we're going to go back, er, go down this one. Is it anterior or is it posterior? So remember that the anterior is those ones that are hyperflexion that we see in ankylosing spondylitis often. This is not, this is a, a posterior injury. So this is a chance type fracture through the bones. So still a very severe injury. Now they, they differentiate osseoligamentous um, with just osseous and that's beyond my pay grade, but we also can't tell that on a CT. But if you look down at the MRI below that, you can see even though this on the CT, this didn't look terrible, on the MRI it actually does look terrible. So this is a sagittal T2. In the intervertebral disc, first of all, we see a big black blob in that disc. So that's hemorrhage in the disc. So we know the disc is disrupted. Anteriorly, we can see that there's some, even though this is a posterior column injury, there is some disruption, some lifting of that anterior longitudinal ligament. But it's really posterior where the money is here. So posterior to the spinal cord, there, is, there should be black ligament all the way down. A black line should be continuous. You can see there's not. So there's ligamentum flavum injury, very Hard to see, very important injury. That It's hard to get those, so that's a very bad one. There's also bright uh, hyperintensity where the intraspinous ligament and the supraspinous ligament, which is also disrupted, should be. So all the ligaments posteriorly are disrupted. Very severe injury. There's um, 
this is kind of complicated, but lower down, all the CSF should be bright around the spinal cord and the conus, little black blobs posteriorly, that's hemorrhage, epidural hemorrhage down there. There's also probably bright mm -hmm. edema within the conus. So there's probably, there was compression at the time of injury. It's re-expanded now. They're, they're like uh, Rosalie was saying, on the scanners, they're on their back. So that kind of realigns them. But when they were injured, there was compression there. So that's probably enough for me to say. Go ahead. And, and what would you say about this? Uh, yeah, so this is a, uh, a chance type fracture, a uh, this clear disruption of the posterior ligament, this complex. Um, I can't imagine this patient's neurologically intact. I'm sure there are some sort of incomplete spinal cord injury. So this patient would, uh, based on the Felix criteria, would, um, would need surgery. Yeah, so you can see that. That was kind of summarized here. So you can see, that th again, this is just an uh, illustration showing the facet joint capsules, intervertebral disc, the, uh, the posterior ligamentous complex. All this stuff has been disrupted in this case. So uh, this, is a, this is a type of case where you would need to intervene. And then I guess going back to this example here, you can see that this is a hyper, hyper oh, uh, do you want to talk about this one here? Yeah, yeah, so this is, you showed, you were pointing to this in one of our very first slides, maybe our, our second slide. This is a different patient, but it's the same injury. So the first picture is a sagittal CT. This person doesn't have ankylosing spondylitis, but something, for some reason, they have an injury that looks like the patients that do. So right under the, um, in, the inferior end plate, of T10, you see there's disruption. There's disruption of the end plate, there's disruption anteriorly as well. So that's a right under the end plate fracture. Um, when you see something like this, you always know it's gonna be a hyperextension, so bending backwards type of injury. And again, you know there's disruption of the anterior ligaments col uh, complex, or the anterior column, so this is gonna be that B type injury. On the MRI, we can see it even better that um, this is a I don't know if this is a stir. I think this is a stir. So you see the bright stuff where there should be no bright stuff on the, on the inferior aspect of that vertebral body. That's all hemorrhage and fluid and edema. We don't have that ligament. That black line that should be there is gone. So the anterior longitudinal ligament is disrupted, broken. Um, behind there, you have spinal cord. Your spinal cord should have CSF around it like it does up higher. It should be dark in the middle and bright on each side. But down here, you see the whole thing is gray. So that's a lot of edema within the conus and injury. Um, and down lower, there's a black blob, which is hemorrhage, black there, yeah. Now, posteriorly, too, we do have a disruption of the ligamentum flavum also, which, um, you know, this is an anterior column, but sometimes they can have additional injuries of the posterior ligaments complex as well, like this one did. So very severe injury. That's good for me. Yeah. That, this, this will certainly require surgery, but you can see how this can look a little subtle. Right? You can be like, oh, it's like a little chip off of the, uh, you know, inferior, anterior inferior portion of the vertebral body. It's probably stable. It looks okay. And then you see I, on MRI, it looks like tremendously worse. But I, I, again, I can't imagine this patient is, um, this patient was neurologically intact with all this cord edema. So uh, that should, just that alone, the neurological exam should key you into something is really, really wrong with this patient. Um, okay. You want to talk about this one, Mike? Sure. And you look at the chat because I keep, I, like I said, I can't pay attention and, and type in the chat box at the same time. So, um, okay. So, again, very bad injury. I think this one might have been a motorcycle collision. Sagittal CT, start with the very worst one. Is there a displacement of one body on another? Yes. So, uh, you know, whatever level this was. There's frank motion. We know this is unstable. We know there's disruption of the anterior column. There's disruption of the posterior column. It has to be, even though you can't see it on CT, by nature of it moving like that, we know it has to be because it doesn't stretch that much. On the MRI, you can see how much more significant the injury is than it looked on CT. Disruption of that it's a black line in the front, anterior longitudinal ligament. There's um, lifting of the posterior longitudinal ligament, which a lot, I'm surprised it's still intact. I guess it is. Um, but there also is ligamentum flavum injury behind that level, interspinous injury. You can't see it all on one slice, but basically all the ligaments posteriorly and pretty much all of them anteriorly are disrupted. Yeah, this is so, like a th so one more thing. Yeah, so and also, so we know, and I, we mentioned this before, this is the worst type, this is type C, but this also contains components of B and A. So we know the tension bands are disrupted, so it has parts of B. We also see there's a little bit of compression, so we know there's some A in it. So C will have parts of B and A, but as you go down, you know, it doesn't go the other way around. A is only A, 
B can be B and A. C has all three, if that makes sense. I, it makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you. It does. This is, this is a very bad three column injury. Again, this will need, this will need surgery. Okay. And this is kind of uh, rehashing what we just uh, showed over there. Okay. So moving a little bit into the cervical spine, because we haven't really talked too much about the cervical spine. Everything has been thoracal lumbar trauma so far. Um, go ahead, Wendy. You want to talk about this guy? Yeah. You know what? We're going to be, we're getting up to the hour. We're not going to get even to infection. We're probably going to be, this is probably going to be two hours of trauma, but that's okay because we can do infection next time if we don't get to it. Um, sure. Because no, this is great. I'm, I'm learning a lot. This is fun. So 53-year-old high-speed crash. Um, so again, this is one of those injuries on CT. You might not think it looks so bad. There's no fracture here. All the vertebral bodies have normal vertebral body height. You'd say, well, you know, they're probably okay, but not necessarily. So in front of the vertebral column, there's a lot of soft tissue. So prevertebral soft tissue swelling. Very, very important when you're looking at your x-rays or CAT scans, um, not as much MRIs. We know there's something wrong. It shouldn't be that, that thick up there. The only thing that causes that is infection or trauma. And in this case, we know it's trauma. So the injury is much worse than we think it is. Then you go down to the two, three, four, two, three, four, five level. So it's not quite aligned. The bodies aren't quite aligned on top of each other. And there's a little chip there, a little fragment in the front. And you say, oh, that's nothing. But between the anterior disc space being wider than the back and a little bit of slippage and that fragment, we know there's going to be an anterior longitudinal ligament injury and all that edema. So this is going to be much worse than we think a hyperextension injury. On the next picture, they actually, this was a little bit later because the person had already started to get on this or? Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Artists. yeah. Yeah, and so very common when you have these injuries where there is motion of the spinal column, you can also have disruption of the vertebral arteries which travel within the spinal column. So you see the vertebral artery in the foramen transversarium on the right, but there is no vertebral artery on the left. So in this injury, which is much more severe than it looks, they have a dissection, which can cause stroke. That's good. You go ahead. Okay. So this is, this is on the right-hand side, you see this is the CT of the, the patient we just talked about. On the left-hand side, this is an image showing uh, an MRI of the normal anatomy. And these are the things that we look at in the cervical spine. So again, one of the biggest confers of stability to the cervical spine, as it is to the thor uh, thoracic and lumbar spine, are the posterior ligamentous complex and the ligaments that hold everything together. In fact, one of the strongest ligaments in the spine is this right here, the, the, uh, the cruciate ligament, or the transverse ligament that holds the, uh, the uh, C1 to C2, okay? Disruption of that ligament is extremely, is, is very, very bad for the patient. Now, as you go, if you, as you travel from caudal to cranial, what you see here, this is just a supraspinous ligament, which then eventually at some point becomes the nuchal ligament, okay? That, uh, that just keeps going up and up towards the occiput. You have the ligamentum flavum, supraspinous and intraspinous ligaments, just like uh, we talked about before. This is the PLL. As the PLL goes up, it then becomes the cruciate ligament or the, uh, and, the, and then becomes contiguous with the tectorial membrane, which is at the top here. And then the ALL, it then becomes the uh, anterior anterior atlanto occipital membrane, which connects the uh, spine to the skull. So this area, the occipital atlanto axial complex, or the OAA, or cranial cervical junction, um, you have a whole bunch of ligaments holding everything here together. In the subaxial spine, C3 to C7, uh, your your biggest things are your facet joints, your uh, nuchal ligament your supraspinous, interspinous ligaments, and your ligamentum flavum. These are all very, very important um, in terms of conferring stability to the subaxial spine. Um, again, as you can see, what, look, at the, look at the soft tissues here. Very, very thin in the subaxial spine. Here, look how thick they are. So this, in itself, clues you into something is happening, and you should probably get some better imaging. So looking here, um, go ahead, Wendy. You want to talk about this? Yeah, see, so, um... Yeah, this is actually a different patient. This is a different one, but same type of um, same type of thing. It didn't look bad at all in the CT, mm -hmm. and it was the same type of a hyperextension injury. So down here at let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This one is even a little bit more subtle on MRI. You can see there's in the disc, anterior disc. There's some brightness, so hemorrhage in the disc below that. Yeah, and then there's some probably some ligamentous stretching or injury. 
But right away, regardless, you can see that in the spinal cord itself, you should always have bright CSF in front and in back of your cord. Here, the cord is expanding to take up the whole canal. There's no hardly any CSF. There is brightness in it. That means there's um, edema. If there was black stuff in it, we would know that there's also hemorrhage, which is even a worse prognosis. And if we did a different sequence, we might even see that. Um, in the middle picture, um, there's a black line in front. That's the, that's the anterior dura, that's the thecal sac. Um, in front of that, the brightness is blood in the epidural space. So that's hemorrhage. The danger of that is it can expand and compress your spinal cords, compress the thecal sac. On the top right, that's just the picture of this guy's brain to show how bad his injury was. This is a diffusion-weighted sequence, and I know you've seen these in some of the other videos when people have gone over um, neuroimaging of brain uh, the last few months and years. But this bright stuff is all axonal injury from a very severe uh, car accident. And then the picture on the bottom is a sagittal CT, and I like this one because this shows something, and this is actually, it's funny, but it's bad because this person swallowed their molars their molars are in the, you know, uh, in their throat right there, which, you know, you'd say, oh, that's a nice picture, but they can aspirate and they can actually die from this. So what we're, for radiology people interested in radiology, whenever you have trauma, always just look at the teeth because if they go down into the, you know, into the airways, into the lungs, that can be fatal. So that's probably all I need to say about that one. This is kind of, um, again, looking at the, uh, the importance of the ligaments and how they contribute to stability in the cervical spine. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the ligaments have essentially been disrupted here. You can see that there's uh, likely disruption of the anterior large tubal ligament. There's, a, uh, as Wendy said, a little bit of hemorrhage in the disc space here. Uh, the supraspinous, interspinous ligaments have, have been disrupted, and there's evidence of a cord contusion at this level as well, too. So one of the things about um, cervical spine imaging, which is really important, is uh, the, the most important imaging, initial imaging test for someone who has suspected cervical spine trauma is a CT of the cervical spine. Uh, you, you generally don't want to get x-rays anymore. In this day and age, uh, there's really no difference in terms of the timing, the ability, uh, and the uh, technical challenges of getting a CT. It, 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 there's no difference between an X-ray and CT. In some cases, it's easier to get a CT than it is to get an X-ray. But your first imaging study for a cervical spine injury should not be an X-ray. It should be a CT. And then from there, you can decide what you want to do. Remember, the, the utility of an X-ray in this will be if you want to con conservatively manage this patient and you have them in the collar and you want to see how their alignment is upright, then you will get an X-ray, an AP lateral X-ray. Um, <clears throat> but your initial imaging study should be a CT. This is showing you there was, a, there was a large study that was done in uh, 2010 and then also one in 2007 um, where they looked at, where they compared CT and MRI to see like, what was a better initial imaging study. And um, in general, uh, CT is, is really the, you really want to just stick with a CT as your initial imaging study. Okay. Um, if you want to get an MRI, I would, I would confer with your, uh, you, I would confer with the, uh, I would get neurosurgery involved before you would uh, order an MRI on a patient like that. Um, again, now for, where is this here? MRI is warranted an unreliable or uptunded patient. This is for someone who has um, uh, an obvious cervical spine injury and, and or you're looking um, to clear their cervical spine. You will need to get an MRI uh, in a patient who you're not able to get a good exam on uh, before you can, like say, for the purpose of taking off a cervical collar. The reason that's okay. important too is that, you know, a lot of places, more and more we have MRI available, but, you know, until the last 10 years, it was hard to get an MRI. Now we run them 24 hours a day everywhere, so it, it's not that big a deal, except sometimes you have patients, you need to screen them before you can, you can't just send any patient to MRI because you need to make sure they don't have any metal, you know, make sure there's nothing, you know, like they have a pacemaker that can't go into an MRI, things like that. So that takes time. Also, MRIs take a lot more time than CT. CT these days can be done in seconds, whereas MRI takes, I don't know, half hour at least. And if you have a patient who's unstable, with a cord injury or any other kind of injuries, you can't send them to MRI or they might die there. You know, you, you right. imagine trying to treat a critically ill patient outside of where you're used to treating them in an MRI, you know, without the team, without the equipment you need. So again, like, like Rosalie just said, yeah, it's probably good to consult neurosurgery still. It's easier than it used to be, but there are a lot of considerations that go into that people don't realize that it's not just easy to order and it gets done. And, you know, sometimes it's not the best choice for the patient.
uh, uh, sending a patient to MRI in the context of acute trauma is, is a unstable and sometimes dangerous uh, thing. And uh, in particular with cervical spine trauma, uh, you know, uh, it's, it can be very dangerous. I've seen in one instance where a patient who was neurologically intact with a pretty bad cervical spine trauma went down for MRI and then they came back complete, uh, complete spinal cord injury. So you have to really be careful and kind of judiciously um, order MRIs when they're, when they're indicated. That, that being said, I don't want to try to imply that I don't think MRI is a useful scan. I think it's incredibly useful. And if it's able to get done expeditiously and safely, then you definitely want to get an MRI because it gives you all the available information you need for if you want to take a patient for surgery or if you want to conservatively manage them. It gives you both um, ability to, to, to make either call. Um, but that being said, don't just, just rotely there should be some thought process into why a patient needs an MRI in this setting of acute trauma. It shouldn't just be like automatic. All right. So uh, there has been an attempt to uh, develop a similar grading scale like TLEX for thoracal lumbar injuries in the setting of subaxial cervical spine injuries. And it's called SLIC and uh, SLIC uh, 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 SLIC uh, grading scale. Uh, it, it's not as commonly used as TLEX and there still needs some larger data to confirm and, uh, and kind of uh, uh, validate its use in a subaxial spine, but it, it, is, it does give us a baseline to, um, to go off of. The only difference with the subaxial cervical spine is, is that these injuries tend to be a little bit more complicated and have many more variants than those in the thoracal lumbar spine. And as you'll see, um, it, it's a little bit complicated. So you can see here, it, they, again, they try to break up into A, B, and C, type injuries, but you also have bilateral injuries and facet injuries. And what's interesting is these type of facet injuries can also be pretty unstable. Even those F1 or F2 or F3, these all may require some sort of surgical intervention versus some of these like wedge compression fractures may require surgical intervention, split fractures may require surgical intervention. It's not as well defined as the uh, TLIX criteria. Hey, before you go on, there's an excellent question that we have, and I don't know if you can see it or if you want me to read it. Oh, no, I'll you can go ahead and read it, yeah. I'll read it, you answer it. So how do you manage a patient if you can't get an MRI? Are there instances where you might have to go straight to surgery? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so in a, so okay, so I'll, I'll preface by saying that a, a level one trauma center, the kind of patient, the, the, the kind of place that a patient like this will go to 99% of the time must have an MRI available for these type of patients, okay? So it, it's a rare instance that you'll get a patient who um, is, you cannot get an MRI on. Um, now, that being said, who knows? Maybe you find yourself in a situation where, you know, an accident occurred outside and they just brought it directly to your hospital and you don't have the ability to get an MRI. Now, if the patient, you, sh you should highly consider, if you do not have an MRI or an ability to treat that patient, you know, without an MRI, um, you should consider transferring the patient to a, a center that can handle those kind of patients and, and get an MRI at the same time. Or in some cases, uh, an MRI is not even needed in order to initiate treatment. Um, you know, in, in certain cases where you have a very obvious uh, type of, let's say, fracture dislocation, or you have a, in a patient who's incomplete spinal cord injury uh, and they're young and you kind of know what needs to be done, you often can just take this patient without an MRI. Uh, MRI in, 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 in certain cases is more useful for, uh, for delineating the levels. Number of levels need to be decompressed in a patient who has a um, acute spinal cord injury. You can tell you if there's a big disc herniation because you don't want to uh, uh, do all posterior surgery on somebody who has a big ventral disc because then you're, you're basically, it's hard to, you're not really accomplishing the goal of the surgery. Um, and also it gives you an idea of whether or not the patient can be considered potentially conservatively managed. Um, you know, if someone has a very benign looking MRI, you may think, okay, this patient can be conservatively managed. But that being said, an MRI is a very useful utility and you should get it whenever, if and whenever possible. Okay, okay. so I don't wanna to get too deeply into these because these are pretty complicated. And these, uh, there's so, I mean, there's so much literature just on these type of um, injuries, the facet type injuries. So these non-displaced facet fractures, so these unilateral uh, non-displaced facet fractures are very unpredictable in the way they behave. And, um, and very frequently these patients, you know, something like this looks very benign, but often they can present later on with, uh, with a non-union and, and, uh, and a very characteristic, a searing radiculopathy, and, and this often requires surgery. So. Um, it's these, these type, these non-displaced facet fractures, 
can often be often require surgery. Um, now, when you have a, a displaced facet fracture, obviously it requires surgery, but these, not all the time, these don't require surgery. Floating lateral masses are a specific subtype of facet fractures that are unstable and require surgery. So you can see that it involves the um, tra uh, transverse foramen, involves a pedicle, involves a facet. And that's the type F3. It's a, uh, it's a, it, this, is a this is a very, as it's mentioned here, it's a very unstable type of fracture. This requires, this requires surgery. And then F4 is a uh, perched or dislocated facet. These um, often will require, these will always require surgery as well too. You can see this is uh, the facet joint has essentially jumped over the um, lateral mass. Um, and then uh, I don't think there's really too much to get into here other than uh, for these kind of patients you have, uh, for a patient with ankylosing spondylitis or DISH where they have a very rigid spine as you can see, or it's called a bamboo spine. I mean, just imagine this type of fracture is like taking a pencil and snapping it in half. Um, it is completely unstable, it's a three column injury, and they often require very large segment fusion, especially if they have concurrent, usually have concurrent injuries. So this guy had a fracture in his cervical spine, he had a fracture in his thoracic spine, and he basically needed like a C2 to probably, I don't know, like an L2 or something, some, some, some sort of big, maybe not L2, but like C2 to probably like T10 or something, some sort of big, um, large segment uh, thoracolumbar fusion or cervical thoracic uh, fusion. I'll say something about it more from the radiology point of view. I think we can slow down because I just, I don't think we're going to get through infection. So I think we can, we can uh, finish up our, our trauma slides here and talk a little bit more about them. Um, this first picture, you just said this. So this person has several things. Um, they have dish, which is flowing anterior osteophytes. If you can point to those with your mouse, presumably. Yes. Um, so that's one thing, and people can have that by itself, three or four levels um, of flowing ventral or ventral lateral osteophytes. This person also has ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, which can go with DISH or it can exist by itself, more common in Asian populations. But you can see, and I'm sorry if you said this, I missed it if you said it, but you can see how that narrows the spinal canal. I told you that your, your spinal cord <clears throat> should have CSF in front and back. If this had an MRI, you would see that there's probably no CSF in front or back because their, their uh, osseous uh, canal is so narrow from that OPLL. So that's very dangerous. The most minor injury can give them cord injury because they don't have any space for that cord to move. Um, and then, uh, did you mention they have that fracture? So this is an, you know, an ankylosing disorder and they have that fracture right under the superior end plate of two, three, four, five, of six. So that was a hyperextension injury caused by the altered biomechanics of their whole spine being fused, not by surgery, but by what, nature, by biology, whatever. They, they're, they are fused mm -hmm. because of their bone forming processes. So very dangerous for them in everyday life. Minor trauma can cause ma major injuries. Yes. And then the next one, I think you said ankylosing spondylitis, another case. These are all different cases, every slide pretty much but it looks like all the rest. So now you, everybody watching should know what this looks like now because you've seen about 10 different cases of this. But again, disruption. So you can see they have that flowing ossification of the anterior longitudinal ligament. Even on CT, you can see there's a problem because there's a disruption that should be calcified all the way up, but there's a, there's a gap there. So they've broken that. And then you look very, very carefully and there is a fracture under the end plate. Mm -hmm. And super subtle because that person's osteoporotic, you can't see much, but you know that because that anterior part is gone and there's a little bit of disruption, we have to look super carefully and diagnose this when they come in the door before they go to any other imaging, before they go to surgery, because they're very, very fragile. And then you talked about the long constructs needed to fix them because they are osteoporotic, they've got altered biomechanics. And, um, and yeah, so that is one of the modifiers. And again, you know, even if you don't use this system, you said, Rizzoli, you said this needs further work and validation, but for me, when I teach my people about this, it's just how to describe because having these descriptors, naming um, the different uh, modifiers like we have here, the ligament injury, the disc herniation, the metabolic bone disease, the um, ossification or vertebral artery abnormality. This teaches us in radiology what we need to look for and put in our reports for you because this is the information you need. Even if you don't give an SLIC score, you need to know that stuff regardless to, to have good treatment of that patient. So I like to, even though it's not well validated or it's not completely validated wherever, I still like to teach it for that reason from RN for descriptive purposes. Is that helpful to you? 
If we measure the stuff like this? Sure. Sure, okay. So yes, it is. Great job. <laughs> well, the s -Lick score requires, uh, you know, s -Lick score requires uh, a neurological exam, which you guys aren't able to obtain, unfortunately. Right. So you can give some component of it, but you can't really give the, uh, the full score. Yeah, we don't want to so, split um, between one descriptors. Yes. So, um, okay. So going back to this, uh, what we see here, is, again, this is a 20-year-old in a high-speed MVA, hyperextension type injury, type B3, right? You can see it right here. Um, and then there was a vertebral artery injury as well, too. So this is a pretty bad injury. I mean, it's not, a, it's not insignificant. It's interesting how relatively benign it looks on the CT, but it's actually a very unstable type of, uh, type of injury. Before so, you go uh, to the next one, let me ask a couple of questions before we get too far away from the topic. Um, so what's the best treatment of choice for, so the critical disc herniation? That's a good one. So this person, say they didn't have any um, fracture, they might have some ligament injury, but they have a critical disc herniation. What does that mean to you? That's compressing the cord. You can't see that on CT. Maybe right. see it on MRI. Yep. So what does that mean to you as a surgeon? Uh, well, okay, you can't see it on CT, but this, this is the kind of patient you want to get an MRI on, exactly for that reason. You want to see if there's a big disc herniation. Um, so, and then you would need to, you would likely need to operate on it. I would imagine that this patient has uh, some sort of cord contusion. I don't know what, it doesn't say what his uh, neurologic exam is here. But uh, I would imagine this patient has a cord contusion, probably has a, um, a acute, acutely herniated disc, so he would need a, he would need a, like an ACDF procedure. Yeah, and similar, there's another question. It says, in patients like this with DISH, but if they're neurologically intact um, with fracture, should they undergo surgery? And I think the mm -hmm. answer is yes, because they are unstable. Yes, yes, right? they're grossly unstable. They often, interestingly enough, they often present intact. They usually are intact, and this is exactly why these patients are very, very kind of dangerous and, and scary in some ways, because this is where, exactly where bad things happen. So, and I see this happen very frequently. They come in, they have kind of a benign looking CT or X or whatever. And sometimes even they just get an X-ray, it looks kind of benign. Um, it's a hyperextension type injury. Typically they're intact. And then um, if it's just kind of, they're you know, admitted to medicine or something for pain control, no one really takes them seriously. They're being transferred from bed or they try to get up and out of bed to chair or something happens. And then these patients just completely fall apart. And then, uh, and then they become, you know, something that was very easily avoided becomes this hyper emergency all of a sudden. So, um, so yes, yeah, so th those, even if they're neurologically intact, they, they often need surgery because they're grossly unstable. And then let me answer the last one. It says a traumatic patient undergoes surgery as metallic prostheses to stabilize. Um, do you image postoperatively with MRI? Is it, is it contraindicated less titanium? Well, I think all hardware is, is MRI compatible these days. The issue is the artifact in MRI caused by the metal. Sometimes it can be very difficult to see the contents of the canal if you're looking at the spinal cord, if you're looking at the neural foramen and the nerve roots coming out. Um, you know, there are things we can do, but it is, it, it is a problem if they have extensive hardware. In which yeah. case, you can do other things. You can get CT, you can get myelography, which we'll get to talk about today. There are options, but um, the answer is MRI is not contraindicated, but it can be uh, suboptimal. Let's go ahead. Yes. Should we take a break or do you want to keep going? Yeah, I think let's, let's take a little, let's take a, maybe a little five minute break. Okay. I'll talk. Quite some time. I'll talk because you've been talking. So you get some water and take your break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. In that case, I'll, I'll be right back. You want me to put this on this slide or what, which slide do you want to put it on? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about this one. This is a good one. This one. Okay. I will, yeah. I will step out for two minutes. Yeah. Take your time. This is a long one. This is a long conference. All right. So um, again, I appreciate everybody who's sticking around. Two hours is a long time to um, be learning and there's so much new information here. And again, I just wanna say what I did at the beginning that a lot of this stuff, you know, when you're a medical student, I certainly didn't know any of this stuff when I was a medical student and you all are much more advanced than, than I was. Actually, it wasn't even that long ago, but our radiology was very limited. But you can see the utility of learning radiology and anatomy together. And then also learning, you know, for those of you who are third year, fourth year, in, or interns, um, knowing the cases in which you actually need to know it, knowing the anatomy that's relevant to trauma versus a completely different uh, set of anatomy that's important for tumor or for infection and different body parts, brain, for us, spine. We, we're only going to do spine for you. But um, learning it as a whole with all the different components, the anatomy, um, the physiology, the radiology, is extremely useful. And also, like I said, our goal in this was really to bring together 
neurosurgery, or if you're interested in orthopedic surgery, radiology, neuroradiology, musculoskeletal radiology, and then, you know, neurology too might be treating these patients. Anybody, you know, involved in the what, nervous system might be involved with these patients. ER, critical care. So we all work together on this stuff. And it's, like I said, it's important. I'm learning a lot from Azuli right now, even though I work with him every week. I'm learning new stuff about how these patients are managed that I don't see every day. You know, I see the scans and I might treat some of these patients with cement augmentation, which we'll talk about another day. But really some of these critical management decisions, I'm, I'm learning a lot here, so I'm appreciating this. And hopefully he's learning some radiology, even though he's taking most of the cases. So appreciate everybody sticking around. Um, Next month, like Ryan was saying, there's going to be a, a bigger symposium, a lot more topics. And hopefully, we'll get to do our infection part. This is going to be, I said we started with three topics, then we had two topics, and I think we're down to one today. So as soon as we finish this trauma section, I think we're going to end, and we can answer any more questions, and then we'll save infection yeah. for the next month. Is that good with you, really, to save infection for next month? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Trauma is, a, uh, is very complicated. As you can see, there's a lot of like, well, if this, then this, but not this, unless this and then that. It's as you can see, there's a lot of uh, a lot of it has to do with just a lot of a lot of the decision making is driven by surgical experience um, and uh, and and uh, evidence based studies. And even with the best evidence based studies, we still have a lot of uncertainty of what's the best course of action because everyone is different in some way, right? And everyone has uh, different medical comorbidities. They may be on, let's say, Eloquist, right? That, that totally, you know, changes your decision making. Um, you know, it's a very different. It's a very different if someone's, let's say, a twenty-year-old healthy guy versus like an eighty-eight-year-old on Eloquist with. Um, Tell COPD. them what Eloquist is. Not everybody knows. I know. Yeah, it's an anticoagulant medication. So it, it, it's a it, and it's hard to reverse. So uh, you know, you, that can it, what that essentially means that you're 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 gonna. When you, if you decide to operate on this patient, it could be a bloodbath. And that's not very good for someone who has significant, let's say, CH, uh, uh, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, AFib, all these numerous comor medical comorbidities. So, um, you know, it's not, the decision for surgery is not one that's just, you know, you don't, you don't just shoot at the hip. You have to actually think about for each patient and the uh, morphology of their trauma and um, their medical comorbidities, their personal desires in some cases, and, um, and uh, the neurology exam. And that's why we developed rating scales such as SLIC or TLEX to help us make these decisions because they can be very difficult at the time of, um, of trauma. Wait, go back, go back, because I don't think we talked about the last two cases. Go back one more. Which, wait, this one? We didn't talk about this one yet, but before we do, there's one more really, there's another good question here. Yeah. Um, they're asking, do we suggest CTA or MRA for fractures of facet or foramen transversarium if there's a non-undisplaced fracture? Mm -hmm. hmm. um, That's a good yeah. question, yeah. Yeah, so it, what I've seen is it's institutional. Um, some places, they, they always get a CTA, not, not an MRA, but they get a C, because it can be difficult to get an MRA, at, and it's not as sensitive as a CTA is um, uh, for, uh, for dissection. Um, but what it, what it can do is, uh, uh, there's some, it's really some, sometimes institutional protocol. Sometimes uh, there, are, there are a series of clinical decision rules, um, either for um, penetrating traumas or blunt traumas to the neck, whether or not they should get a CTA. Uh, and that being said, uh, very frequently these patients are asymptomatic, meaning uh, they don't have any evidence of a uh, vertebral artery dissection. However, if you get a CTA, they often have spasm. They have really weird things uh, frequently with these, um, these uh, non-displaced uh, fractures of the frame and transverse area. So from what I've seen personally and what I've done at, uh, let's say, at the place I've worked at, which have been trauma centers, such as Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, uh, Metro Health in Cleveland, um, and a few other places in New York City, generally any fracture that involves a, the, trans, the frame and transverse area, um, we get a CTA. And, uh, and then that can often guide decision-making. Sometimes these patients need to be on aspirin for some period of time if they have vasospasm after that kind of a fracture. So uh, yes, now that being said, I know there's some places that don't get them if the patient's asymptomatic and has, let's say, no neck pain or so on and so forth. Um, uh, they, uh, they, they don't necessarily get them. But um, I tend to err on the side of caution in these, in these trauma patients because it's so much is, so much is uh, uh, up in the air and um, many bad things can happen these to these patients in the acute period. 
So frankly, I mean, they're going to be getting pan trauma scans anyway. They're going to like, they're, it's like the entire body is going to get CT. What is one extra CTA in terms of the radiation dosage? I mean, it can really, um, it can really help you. And if these patients develop brainstem strokes or posterior fossa strokes as a result of the virtual bar dissection, I mean, it's indefensible in, in court and it's also devastating to the patient. So uh, I, I personally, I would recommend a CTA for, uh, for framers, framer transverse fractures of uh, the either C2 or, or really any, anywhere in the, uh, in, the, in the cervical spine. I'm going to just add to what you just said. You, you alluded to it, but I don't know if you said it strongly enough that never think that you don't want to radiate patients, but I think people are too afraid of radiation. One CAT scan is nothing, and I'm probably going to get in yeah. trouble saying this, and, and I'm going to get yelled at by any radiologist now who's, who's listening to this, but <laughs> it's it's – if your life is at stake, if you're going to have a stroke, you want that CTA. That little bit of radiation, which isn't even proven to hurt you, is nothing. Um, so always, never, never be scared to order a CT. Now, the CTA also, probably a more important thing that comes up is contrast. A lot of these patients, if they're critically ill, um, might have altered renal function, especially if they're older, they're, you know, got core morbidities or something. That might be a place where you get pushback. Can you give, how much contrast can you give? Because you don't want to wreck your kidneys. Well, New literature, and again, we'll talk about this in the future, we'll go into it today, shows that really there is no reason not to give more contrast. Contrast does not cause kidney failure. Again, this is heretical, and I'm going to get in trouble, but this is what the literature says. It's very new. And so if you get pushed back from your radiologist, tell them that uh, they need to read the literature. Uh, I, I hope this gets edited out because we get in trouble for that, but it's true. So go on. All right. Do you want me to do this one? You do this one. Uh, no, go ahead. You can okay, so this is another one where, you know, it doesn't, that first picture doesn't look that bad. You, you get your CAT scan, you send this picture to your, you know, your chief or whatever. You say, this looks fine. All the vertebral bodies are fine. There's no fracture there. I think there's some pre-vertebral edema, which, I, which is cut off in the front picture, but there is some, so watch out for that. So we know there is something wrong there. But really, the alignment is good. Vertebral body height is good. Probably that person's okay. But then you go off to the side, and you see there's a facet fracture. And actually, there were two. Can't show them both on here because we don't have enough pictures. Oh, wait, no, maybe there was, this one was only one. Was it only one? What does it say? Unilateral. It's only one, yes. So you can see that facet fracture down there. Now, in the MRI, again, you see the vertebral bodies look okay, the discs look okay, the cord looks okay. But there's a lot of brightness in the musculature in the back of the neck. That was a you know, whiplash-type injury in addition to a ligamentous injury with that facet, the facet capsule. Yeah. So again, these unilateral facet fractures are very unpredictable in the way they behave. And uh, although they look kind of benign, they frequently can present with delayed, uh, delayed deterioration, delayed problems. So uh, this, kind of a, this kind of a fracture often requires um, surgery, believe it or not. Even though it, it looks like very benign, it, it, it tends to create a lot of problems for these patients. So I actually, I'll share something. I actually had a fracture like that. I got, when I was in medical school, my first year I got hit by a drunk driver and I got a fracture like that. And um, indeed, I, I didn't know anything at the time about this kind of stuff, but indeed it was much more severe because that they told me, my neurosurgeon told me that fragment could go into the foramen transversarium, it could move, it could, you know, cause potential injury if they didn't treat it right away. So they, those can be significant, right. I know. I'm also going to answer a question at this point that's a good question. It says, as a neurosurgeon and a radiologist, do you agree on the threshold for surgery for cord compression, or is it different to report and to operate? And that is an excellent, excellent question, because a radiologists, you know, we, we don't operate. So I would never argue with a surgeon who says this needs an operation. But what's important, and this we'll talk about in the future in our tumor talk, is how do we describe it? And do we describe the same way the surgeons describe it? Because that's important. If I say there's mild cord compression and the surgeon says this person's, you know, got all these neurologic symptoms, it's horrible, that's, that's an issue. If I say there's mild cord compression, it might not even get to the neurosurgeon, you know, or, say, you know, or delayed. So that kind of, that's, that's where the issue comes between our different specialties and how we have to work more closely together. I would never tell Rizuli when to operate or not, but... I do want to be speaking the same language he does so that when I have my report or I call him, I'm using the language he needs to make his decision on surgery. That's the answer to that question. <laughs> yes, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I would just say uh, it depends on 
I'm, I'm, maybe I, I didn't understand the question. You, the question was, uh, what degree of core compression do we decide to operate? Yeah, do we ever disagree? And I, so my point was, I don't make the decision, but yeah. what we call core compression should be the same, you and I. And right. it is, uh, yeah, for sure. unless we work together, right? So yeah. that's a big deal. That's a huge thing that needs to be fixed. Yeah. I don't think there's any hard and fast rules that depends on the patient's clinical condition, whether that's acute or chronic cord compression. Um, these are very, very different clinical entities. Um, you know, how, how again, it, it, you shouldn't just let imaging dictate your surgical intervention. You're just like, oh, this, you know, core compression, you need surgery. You have to always look at the patient, their clinical status, how they're doing, um, you know, what the patient's uh, desires are. These are all things. But again, it, that's different in an acute trauma setting. So that can be a very different, let's say, core compression in the acute trauma setting can be very different from core compression in a patient who's elective with like cervical myelopathy. The timing of that sur surgery and the nature of that intervention will be different. But listen to your radiologist too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right, I'll do this real quick. So okay. again, going through our algorithm, just like with the thoracolumbar spine, this is for the, how you go through and, and evaluate the severity. Start at the top. Is there frank translation subluxation? Yes, there is. We already we can stop right there. We already know this is the very worst kind of injury. Neurosurgery, you just get there right away and get this guy. The, you know he's got uh, cord injury. There's complete compromise of the canal, fecal sac. You know this is a bad one. Posterior and anterior column injury. Um, uh, that's probably enough. Anything else to say about that one? Um, what do these what, people do? How do you think this person's going to do? And what would you do to them? I, I would assume that I would assume this patient is uh, probably a complete uh, spinal cord injury. Although sometimes, I mean, you'd be very surprised. Some of these guys can be intact. It, it's either it's either going to be one of two things. It's either going to be complete spinal cord Asia A, or they're going to be um, Asia E. They're going to be completely intact. And um, in this case, because this is a three column injury, grossly unstable, this patient will need a front back. <clears throat> Um, okay, so yeah, this, this, yeah, go ahead if you want, this, this, is, like you said, yeah. this is more subtle, um, right. the point was the management, yeah, 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 so, and that's, oh, that shows your point, so you were talking about, is there a little bit of air in there, you right. said gas, air, so yeah, I, I actually thought, well, I don't see that very often, but there it is, right there, so, <laughs> there's your, there's your point, but, um, this, so this person did not have ankylosing spondylitis, or dish or anything, but one of the other disorders that makes your spine stiff and changes it biomechanically, so it's one big lever arm, is end-stage spondylosis, degenerative change. Even though this didn't look that bad, this is all that we could think of that caused this person's um, kind of under the end plate type of fracture. Um, this one, so this is a complex one, and we won't go through too much because it's probably too complex, but you can see there's a fracture under the end plate like we've seen on the others. That top part of the spine slid backwards and compressed the cord. So it was, they, they went forward and they went back. So it was a hyperflexion. So the, the top of the spine went forward into the canal. In the back, you see there's a big gap between the spinous processes. So we know there's disruption of the posterior ligamentous complex as well. The anterior ligamentous complex, you know, there's a fracture there, but we don't know how disrupted that was. It's at least a B, if not, I would say, even a, an A-type injury. There probably is a little bit of subluxation. Hard to tell. On MRI, in the next one, I told you that on the T1s, they should be bright. The body should be bright unless there's edema or tumor in them. Those are dark, so we know that's an acute injury. Mm -hmm. We can also see there's bright stuff in front of the spinal cord. On the T1, as, you, as Nader Dalai told you, there shouldn't, the, spine, the CSF should not be bright. It's dark. So if there's bright stuff, that's blood. So they have hemorrhage and that can expand and compress the cord in addition to the fracture, in addition to the, the moving of the spine because it's unstable because it's broken with both ligaments and bones. And then in that last picture, you can just see, you know, the, the edema in the bodies. You can see edema under the anterior longitudinal ligament, disruption of the posterior longitudinal ligament, all the lines, black lines, ligaments black all the time, have to be continuous. And then what was done with this person was an anterior fixation only. And I'll let Razuli talk about whether that was appropriate or not. I kind of didn't think it was, but I'm not the surgeon. So. Yeah. So 
you know, the problem with this type of a fracture and this type of a spine is that, again, these hyperextension type injuries um, tend to be very unstable and they tend to require a anterior and posterior type of um, fixation. Now, it, you probably uh, could get away with a, um, a uh, anterior only procedure here because I, I don't know if this involved, uh, did it, it looks like it involved the uh, posterior ligaments complex, right? Here? For sure. So on the CT, yeah. you can see the spleen, the spine is processed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I forgot. I didn't. So definitely, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Spine is yeah, yeah. Probably ligamentum yeah, yeah. on the on the third picture. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. absolutely. It's a level exactly higher right. than the fracture. So, it's, it's exactly, a exactly. So th this this is one that I I personally would treat with the front back. So I would or 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 posterior only procedure. Uh, you you need to address this. This is very. This is shows. Uh, you have obvious intercom injury and you have obvious posterior com injury. 360. It requires either a front back or in this case, you, you could probably be fine with a posterior only procedure, but um, an anterior only procedure, you're not addressing the um, instability in the back here. So this patient could, and it's also a level above where this fracture was. So uh, you could, you could uh, set this patient up for something bad happening. Um, additionally, uh, as you can see with all these osteophytes, there's basically so minimal disc here and it's, uh, it's all fused and it's, there's very, it's very hard to get a good sense of the anatomy in this case. And we can end up doing is taking off too much of the vertebral bodies above and below. So you end up doing partial corpectomies at this level and this level, which was likely done here. And then the graft you put in here could easily subside and then cause more problems for this patient. Um, and they're going to require, they develop a cervical uh, kyphosis and chin on chest deformity. And then you have like just disaster bill. So, uh, so hopefully, I don't know what happened to this patient, but hopefully that did not that, that was not the case. Uh, just a caveat because I know people from my institution are watching this. This case was not from my current okay. <laughs> institution, good, so good. nobody gets mad at me. So right, all right. So the last type of fractures we want to talk about um, because we're getting low on time is almost it's almost time, and I know you guys are getting a little tired, um, or or maybe I am. <laughs> so um, so anyway, so uh, th these are very common fractures that we see, in, in particular in the geriatric population. Uh, patients who are a little elderly, usually they're in the like the late 80s or 90s, um, and they suffer a ground level fall, and they can often present with a very uh, insidious type of neck pain, and then they get imaged. You, again, the radiographic imaging study of choice is a CT of the cervical spine, um, and then we often see these type of fractures or odontoid fractures. Okay, in this case, this was an 88 year old uh, man who fell and had persistent neck pain. He was actually he uh, got an X-ray which was read as negative. It was very subtle. And then he came back to the emergency room like a day or two later with uh, worsening neck pain. They got a CT and it showed this, that he had a, uh, a fracture, a pretty clear fracture of his odontoid. And, and there's some displacement as well, too. So three different types of odontoid fractures. They're classified based on the Anderson and Delonzo classification is one, two, and three. Um, you can see type one is just like essentially a chip or an evolution fracture at the tip of the odontoid process. Type two is a fracture at the base. So the whole odontoid process is um, displaced. And then the type three involves basically the body of the um, odontoid. A uh, uh, body of C2, excuse me. Now, in general, type one and type three can be conservatively managed and they generally heal well. It's the type twos that have high rates of non union and uh, can often present with um, delayed deterioration in these patients and, and uh, often require some sort of a surgical intervention. So, um, as I mentioned before, the imaging x rays can be done. If you're going to do an x ray, you have to, absolutely have to request the open mouth odontoid view, which you see here, which really shows the fracture quite well. No, um, it doesn't. You know, Don't lie. <laughs> all right. Well, then, uh, you can barely see that. These are hard. You really you think that shows it quite well? Yeah, How do you know yeah. that's not artifact? Because we uh, know from maybe the sagittal, because well, you know the person then, has it. But would you ever? Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the radiologist will say can or cannot rule out a odontoid fracture, and then they will order a CT. So. <laughs> oh yes, because I would argue that these are so hard to see on X-ray for sure. Yeah. Get a CT if you suspect it, right? Yeah, just get just get a CT. I, I totally agree. Just, just your imaging study of choice should be a CT just from the beginning because then you don't have to really worry about this. Um, another thing that an open mouth odontoid view shows you is um, whether or not there's uh, whether or not the um, uh, transverse ligament which holds the odontoid process to C1 is still intact. And we do that by looking at the um, ADI or the alanto dental interval, which would be generally less than two or three millimeters in an adult patient. Or you look at what's called the rule of Spence, where you um, you look at if there's any overlap of C one lateral mass over C2, and you add those up. I'm, I'm not going to get into that right now, but basically that's an indirect way of knowing whether or not the atlantal dental, uh, the transverse ligament is intact. So you can see this is type one on a CT, much much better seen on CT, little chip off the odontoid, fracture at the base of the odontoid for type two, and then fracture to the body for type three. Um, MRI, uh, it, it can be sometimes hard to see these fractures on MRI, 
Um, although the MRI is good for sometimes seeing an injury of the transverse ligament, it can show you if there's a spinal cord injury, show you if there's a disc herniation, or if there's a, uh, if there's any like large degenerative panis, or sometimes these things coexist with um, uh, getting older and having these odontoid fractures. So these are just MRI is is useful in these cases. So wait, wait, um, anyway. Uh, can I add something there? Let you catch your sure. breath, I'll add something. So on these cases, so I was a fellow um, at Vero, what, five years ago, and we um, did a paper that came out right after I graduated on odontoid fractures in the elderly. And it's interesting because unlike other fractures where you're going to have, I told you, you'll have dark stuff on, in the vertebral bodies where there's edema. Elderly people with odontoid fractures over half do not have that. And you said it's hard to see on, on MRI, and that's why. Because the fracture, the marrow can look normal because we hypothesize that they don't have the blood flow in the vertebrae that maybe they do if they're younger. So a lot of old people, this can be hard because it doesn't have the appearance of a fracture anywhere else in the spine. And mm -hmm. your, your key in this picture is the prevertebral edema. You can just point that out because, again, that's always key, that prevertebral bright stuff in front of the spine, which should never be there. Can you point to that? Yes. Point to it. Yeah. Okay. This right here, right? Yes. Yeah, pre rotibular edema. Yeah. We're always getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for the type one uh, fractures, these are uh, avulsion type fractures. Um, <clears throat> there, there's really no consensus because they're very rare on what to do with them. Um, in general, they uh, are managed conservatively, but you really have to rule out any other associated fractures, such as, again, atlantoxibal dissociation, which is devastating, or lentoaxial subluxation. So, um, in these kind of in these kind of uh, fractures, you just really want to make sure that nothing uh, bad is happening. Now, for the type three type fractures, um, these are typically stable. Um, these uh, generally uh, will heal with some sort of external mobilization, whether that's a halo or a rigid collar. Um, the traditional studies show that uh, there's better fusion rates with halo vest brace, but this is not in this day and age. These are this has become kind of a passe uh, form of treatment. Um, it's it's it comes with high morbidity and high uh, uh, patient uh, dissatisfaction, and uh, and uh, it's difficult for patients to comply with this type of uh, uh, type of treatment, external immobilization. So very frequently, people just commit these patients to rigid collars with maybe like a, a forehead strap. Um, now, the type two type, the type two odontoid fractures are the most common type of odontoid fracture, and um, the optimal treatment remains controversial. Okay, so in, broadly speaking, these patients are either treated conservatively or treated with surgery. Okay, which is pretty much the case with anything. But conservative treatment is, the goal of the treatment varies based on the patient's age and medical comorbidities and their possibility or their pre-procedural probability of developing a complication due to surgery, okay? So um, again, the overall non-union rate in these patients, regardless of old or young, is about 30%. So this, that's very, very high. So imagine you have a fragment that's kind of like, just kind of moving around there that's not fused. In your, in your upper cervical spine that could potentially compress the cervical spine, it's kind of a scary situation. Now, um, again, broadly speaking, uh, surgery for these type of fractures can either be through anterior odontoid screw fixation, which is not really commonly done. And there, there are a lot of limitations, although it looks slick and it looks pretty cool, like, wow, this, is a, you know, this looks pretty cool. Um, it's, it's not, it's technically challenging and um, there are high failure rates associated with this. And, uh, and it's not, um, it's just not commonly done. Typically, these patients will get uh, a C1, a C12, or a uh, or occiput cervical fusion, which is very morbid and tried to avoid it. But generally, a, a C12 fusion is done for these for these patients for these uh, type two odontoid fractures. And then for those who can uh, tolerate or are good uh, candidates for external mobilization, it's either a halo or a rigid collar. Which the bias is towards doing a rigid collar for these patients. Uh, now I can skip this, but. The main things for why, why we would operate on patients is um, as we get older, the risk of non-union progressively increases. And it doesn't just increase um, like, you know, by a couple percentage points. It's like 10, 10 to 20 fold increase for every decade of life. So it becomes, as older you get, the higher, the, the super higher rates of non-union. Um, if it's very majorly displaced, obviously, I mean, there's no contact surface for the bone to fuse. Um, type 2A fractures are a type of comminuted um, odontoid fracture. Uh, those have a high rates of non-union. Uh, so those those typically require uh, surgery. If you have trans, uh, disruption of the transatlantic ligament, that will require surgery as well too, because the fragment can move around, and then if it moves around, it doesn't fuse anything, right? And then um, and or uh, failure of external mobilization. Now 
Uh, the main thing I want to say here is for the geriatric population, it, it's very kind this odontoid fractures are generally thought of as being a problem of the geriatric population or the vast majority of the people you'll see are geriatric uh, who have these type of fractures. And the question is what to do with them because they tend to be old, they tend to, they're, they're old, they tend to be frail, they tend to have numerous medical comorbidities. And then committing them to surgery is not an easy thing. They're, they're usually poor surgical candidates, okay? And there are a lot of comorbidity or a lot of, it's not just so much them surviving the surgery, it's all the post-operative recovery. You know, they're immobilized, they're in pain, they get DVTs, they get pneumonia, they get all these problems um, post-op that, uh, that you wonder why do we treat them? So really the goal, and there's some good, very, very good literature to support this. The goal of, uh, uh, of an odontoid fracture, the, the treatment goal in, a geri in an elderly frail patient is a stable fibrous non-union, okay? What that means is that there's no evidence of fusion on an x-ray, but they're it can essentially clinically asymptomatic. And, uh, and they're, let's say they're tolerating like a rigid collar, and they're not, that fragment is not like majorly moving around on a flexion extension x-ray. Uh, that, that is a excellent outcome in a patient who's, let's say like 88 or not, you know, say 90 years old, sometimes 100 years old uh, and, uh, and, and, and frail and committing them to a, a large uh, cervical surgery is not necessarily in their best interest because they, they tend to have um, very high uh, intra-hospital uh, 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 adverse events, um, as, as seen on, on, on large population studies that have been done on these patients. So your surgical options are anterior down to screw fixation, as I mentioned before, or posterior cervical fusion, which can be either typically a C12 or an occiput to cervical fusion, where you skip uh, like C1 and C2 typically. Uh, so odontic screw fixation is generally for more acute type fractures because you don't want, um, you want the bone to be fresh, freshly fractured, you don't want to be sclerotic. Um, and the benefit of this that you, you once you, you kind of, you put in a lag screw and you, you bring the two fragments together and once there's contact there, you're, you're basically done. There's no, there's no need for um, an external brace. They don't need, uh, they're not, you're not fusing C1 and C2 together. You're just basically bringing the, fra you're, you're fixing the fracture. That's the, the goal of that surgery. And um, they're, they're gonna preserve their motion at C1 too, which is nice. And this high fusion rate is a little bit under debate, but if it's done well and the, the patient has a favorable, uh, bone healing, and to do these patients tend to be osteoporotic, um, but if they do have favorable bone healing, the biology of their bone healing is good, then um, they, they can heal quite well. Um, and then there are certain things about the procedure that, or certain things about the patient themselves that will be contraindications to this procedure, such as a bowel chest, you can't get the right angle to place the screw, um, if they have a short neck, you, you, again, you can't, it's all about getting the right angle, because it's a very, very uh, steep angle that you're, you're getting that screw in there. Uh, and then uh, different types, the, the morphology of the fracture too can be a factor. And then the other, other treatment option is a posterior C12 fusion. Um, in this case, the most common, the two most common uh, procedures employed are the harms construct or polyaxial screws, lateral mass screws at C1, and then um, either PARs or pedicle screws at C2 or translaminar screws at C2 um, connected through rods and, uh, and caps. And then, um, or a magro construct, which is uh, it's just a transarticular screw. It's one big screw that goes through C2 and C1, and um, you put on both sides, and it, it just uh, stabilizes that construct. This typically has a much higher fusion rate than the harms construct. It's just much more technically demanding, and um, and there's higher rates of vertebral artery injury with this procedure as compared to the harms construct. Um, the harms construct fusion rates can be improved with the addition of a interlaminar uh, 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 allograft and wiring. And typically, uh, more and more people are, are utilizing that method. Let me, before you go on, let me ask, um, there are a couple of questions popping up. Is there a pre-op screening measure um, preferred or standard at your institution for determining surgical versus conservative management in type 2 odontoid fractures? Yeah. Um, there, 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 there is no, uh, uh, I would say there's no unified um, imaging study. I mean, typically these patients get the whole gamut of uh, imaging tests. They typically get a CT, MRI, and x-ray as well too. And, but the, the, the question is, is what is the goal of the, what is this patient's treatment goal? That, and that's what varies. So again, as I mentioned, the goal, the, the, a satisfactory outcome in a, in a older, sicker patient is a stable fibrous non-union. And that can be confirmed on a flexion extension x-ray. 
So typically what we do for these patients, if they have a fresh odontoid fracture and they're neurologically okay, they're not uh, spinal cord injured, or they, um, they're not, uh, uh, they're, they're basically neurologically intact. These patients, you can place them in a rigid collar and then, uh, and then just follow them with serial x-rays. And then as long as they, they, there's no gross movement of that fragment and they're not developing evidence of spinal cord compression, then that's, that's, you've achieved your treatment goal there. Then that patient is, is far better off than getting a, uh, you know, committing them to a, a large, uh, a large, well, I don't know if you would consider it a large, but just in general, bring them to surgery, having them recover post-op, send them to rehab, all those things are very, can be very, very detrimental to the patient. So, um, one other one, uh, yeah. do you keep the person in a rigid collar after surgery? And if so, for how long? Yes. So they, these typically these patients, um, again, it, it varies on the patient themselves, but uh, they will be required to wear a collar for a rigid collar for quite some time. And it's typically on the order of a, about a year. Uh, it could be a little bit more, a little bit less than that, depending on, again, the, you, need, you would need to clear them on a flexion extension x-ray and see if that fragment moves around a lot. Really what you're trying to see is stability of that fragment on that x-ray. And because these patients are old and have bone, poor bone healing um, and just poor healing in general, it usually takes about a year for that to get better. That's really uncomfortable to wear a hard collar for a year. That's horrible. Okay. Yeah, but but that being said, um, they're, 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 so if you have an odontoid fracture, your risk of death from all causes is within two years is, is like, is almost like 30 to 40%. It's very high. It's almost like a, uh, a, uh, the hip fractures of the day, in, back in the day. Like, you, fractures. Same thing from different causes. Yeah. Right. Pulmonary, so yeah, things like that. Yeah. Your, so you have to think, you have to weigh the risk and benefit of now that being said, to do surgery on these patients is very, very morbid. There's a very big AO spine uh, paper uh, 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 from Jen, uh, by Je, uh, Dr. Jens Chapman, which looks specifically at uh, essentially surgical versus conservative management of a non fraction in the geriatric population. And the morbidity and the mortality of a surgical arm was far greater than the conservative arm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that being said, uh, you have to think to yourself, can this patient tolerate surgery and the risk of complications post-op, okay? If you think they can, then surgery may not be a bad option. However, that being said, if you do not think they can, okay, then having them in a rigid collar, even if it's for a year, is, is a better option for them because they could have a very high risk of having a not insignificant complication post-op. So you always have to weigh those risks and a benefit. And again, these kind of patients are, ch are challenging because uh, you know they have to you have to see them very frequently in clinic. They you know you frequently have to speak you know it's. Uh, it has to be a very good doctor-patient relationship established with this patient. You can't just send them off with a collar and never see them again. You really have to follow them closely. You have to get follow-up x-rays. You, you have to monitor their clinical exam and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and be on a lookout for delayed deterioration or, or development of cervical myelopathy. These are all things you need to be aware of. So uh, sometimes it's, it's harder to treat these patients conservatively for you as a surgeon than it is um, to just take them to surgery. That part two of that question was, do you do swallow studies on these people? I mean, does that impair? Like, uh, not, not unless there's a, not unless they have a problem. Is that, no, so uh, I don't know if that's because of this, for surgery or for collar, does collar make it hard to swallow because it's holding your chin up? It, uh, it's a good question because sometimes these patients can present with dysphagia um, due to the prevertebral soft tissue swelling. Mm. Um, you know, we, we, if there is an issue that they can't swallow, then, which, which does happen. And frankly, this is more of a uh, problem in the post-operative period, believe it or not. A lot frequently these patients require NG tubes or, or, or uh, even PEG tubes uh, if they got surgery as compared to not, not getting surgery. But um, uh, if, they're, if they complain of a problem, then we'll get a swallowing study. Yeah. Uh, this was just a rehash of what I said before, basically, um, that the biomechanically, these, both of these constructs, either transarticular or the C12, are, um, are comparable, although the transarticular has higher rates of fusion than the C12, or than the, um, uh, the lateral mass and uh, parse construct. Um, and you can improve the rates of fusion with the uh, ARMS technique by incorporating uh, interlaminar wiring with allograft or, um, or iliac crest. I think that's it. Is that the end? Oh, we're not doing that today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh,
Okay, so I think what, we have about four more minutes left. So do, do you want to take any more questions or? So thank you to all these people who are saying very nice things in the Q and A. Um, and yeah, this has been great. Like I said before, when, when Rizalu was getting his drink of water, I've learned a lot too today. This has been fantastic. Uh, I think it's really nice to, to have both sides of the story, um, radiology and surgery. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else here that we didn't address. I don't think so. I think occipital, occipital neuralgia. How common is occipital neuralgia? This is interesting because, you know, we've had patients with constructs. I don't know what type of fractures, but they need um, injections from us for occipital neuralgia. How, how commonly does that happen? Because I don't know the answer about the, how that relates to your surgery. Yeah. We so that. we only have two minutes. So, fast. so basically, uh, the, the C1 lateral mass screw, um, it's hard to see on this x-ray, but um, the, the screws have knurling on them. And what can happen is if the C2 ganglion is in contact with that knurling of the screw, it can basically irritate the nerve and cause occipital neuralgia. It's not that common anymore um, with the advent of lag screws, where it, or, or um, I, forget the name. I don't think it's actually technically a lag screw, but it's basically a type of screw where um, a, a significant portion of it is smooth and then just the tip of it has knurling. Um, those are less likely to cause occipital neuralgia. However, that being said, the most, the, really the biggest risk of occipital neuralgia is not so much a screw, it's how much manipulation of it um, and or uh, uh, if you ended up having to um, do monopolar cautery or bipolar, if you like buzzed it by accident or you injured it by accident during the mobilization of it for the placement of the C1 lateral mass screw, um, that, that can cause neuralgia. Now, um, what's interesting is that that being said, there are some surgeons just don't even want to deal with that. And they just basically counsel a patient that they'll have some uh, degree of scalp numbness after the surgery. And they just take the nerve and they just don't deal with that risk of occipital neuralgia. Um, and, uh, and then those, those patients do absolutely fine. So, uh, there's some studies actually by, uh, uh, Ali Bosch of, um, of, uh, of, uh, virtual global spine, uh, to show that those patients do just fine with, um, with numbness or, or taking the, of the C2 ganglion bilaterally. So, um, we'll see. Uh, I, I, I don't remember the actual, the actual, um, incidence of occipital neuralgia after C1 lateral mass screw placement, but I, I'm, we can look that up very easily. Yeah, I've just seen it a couple times where they've consulted us to do injections for that. Yeah. So, but not commonly. And sometimes when it's, it's when there's hardware failure and the screws are broken, so maybe they're moving or, you know, maybe a post-op issue as well, not just during the surgery. Yes. All right, Ryan, we came to the end of the hour. I Everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.